David Lindauer is the Stanford Calderwood Professor of Economics at Wellesley College. Before Wellesley, Professor Lindauer was a faculty associate of the Harvard Institute for International Development, and he has served as a consultant to the IDB, UNDP, USAID, and the World Bank. He has traveled throughout Africa, the Caribbean, and East Asia, engaging in research and policy advising. He received a BS in economics in 1973 from the City College of New York and an MA in 1976 and a PhD in 1979 from Harvard University. In 2001, he was awarded the Anna and Samuel Panansky Prize for Excellence in Teaching. Professor Lindauer's research focuses on labor market issues in developing nations. His research includes skill mismatches in Belize, labor relations in Korea, uh, racial affirmative action in Malaysia, worker productivity in Ethiopia, minimum wage policy in the Philippines, and government pay and employment in Zambia. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lindauer. Fifteen years from now, my grandson Bodhi will be a teenager. All of you will be in your 30s, and statistically speaking, some of you will have children Bodhi's age. Um, Joe, I think you and I will are hoping to be enjoying retirement. <laughs> well, I know I am. Um, what do we all hope the world's going to be like 15 years from now, in 2030? Uh, world leaders will be gathering in September of 2015 at the United Nations to approve a set of sustainable development goals. The SDGs. And these are intended to replace the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, which are set to expire this year in 2015. Um, the SDGs, in some ways, can be thought of as what the world leaders think the world should be like when Bodhi's 16 and all of you are in your 30s. Your group presentations later this month, as I understand it, are, are drawn from some preliminary work on what the SDGs um, will contain. Um, this, the SDGs are also sometimes referred to as the post-2015 development agenda or the post-2015 consensus, and I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, and to help you get started, I wanted to provide some background to the, to the SDGs. I wanted to talk a little bit about what we can learn from previous attempts at setting development goals. Uh, this isn't the first time, obviously, that world leaders have gathered together um, to determine what the world should strive to achieve. The immediate precedent is the MDGs, which were um, agreed upon in 2000 um, at a meeting in the United Nations. But again, this wasn't the first time. And I want to go back a little bit to talk about other times the world came together and, and thought about what kind of goals we should achieve. So, so Joe, I have to ask, did you remember that? You, I did. you do? Do you have it in your office? You don't? <laughs> not anymore. Okay. So shortly before Joe and I started teaching at, at Wellesley, I started in 1981, and if I remember, Joe started the year after that. Um, and this report, it's called the North-South it was called the North-South Report, a program for survival. Uh, the report of the Independent Commission on International Development Issues under the chairmanship of Willie Brandt. Willie Brandt was the chancellor or head of state of, of what was then West Germany in the 1960s and in the early 70s. And this report was published in 1980. Um, it was comprised of what was described at the time of a distinguished group of statesmen academics and other global leaders. Uh, they were assembled to compile this report. So it's very similar. Um, has, has the group been given Homi Karras's report yet? Okay, so the report that, that you've been given about the post-2015 agenda, um, instead of describing the panel that was assembled for that as a group of statesmen, academics, and other global leaders, the committee is described as the high-level panel of eminent persons. Um, so I guess in, in 35 years, we describe people slightly differently. Um, and as I, you know, I've held up, I, I, I own a copy of the Brandt Report. I imagine I used it in my teaching when I first started here. I can't recall for certain. 
I haven't looked at it in a long time. In fact, I haven't looked at it in decades. And in preparation of this talk, I, I found it on my, my bookshelf. I blew off the dust on the top. And I started flipping through it over the weekend to remind myself of what, 1980, that's a long time ago, even for me, and it's, it's, it's a long time. You weren't born then, so it's a really long time ago <laughs> for all of you. Um, the recommendations of the Brandt Commission report, which is, was the other name of this report, sound very, very familiar. Um, eliminate extreme poverty and hunger. Improve education outcomes, especially among girls. Reduce the burden of disease. Malaria is mentioned now, as it is in the MDGs, and it probably will be in the SDGs. Other diseases that were mentioned included river blindness and sleeping sickness, and, and those won't be mentioned again because there's been tremendous progress in eliminating both of those diseases. Instead, we'll have mention of HIV AIDS and Ebola, diseases that would not have been mentioned in the Brandt Commission report. Energy and the environment also are discussed in this report, and somewhat to my surprise, there was even a call for more spending on renewable energy sources, even back in 1980. Um, so it's important to realize that in talking about the SDGs, you know, not a whole lot's new. There's some new things, but the world has been talking about these things for a long time. I think one of the things, the Brandt Commission report, the Millennium Development Goals, and the post-2015 consensus share in common is an attempt to define what we mean by development. Okay. What does that mean? What does economic development or human development mean? And the way the MDGs did it is by defining eight specific goals. Now, in case you've never noticed, if you go up to the economics department on the third floor, excuse me, on the fourth floor of this building, and you look across from where Joe Joyce's office are, there's a poster for each of the eight MDGs. I don't know how many of you have ever noticed that when you've been in the economics department. Um, the eight posters refer to the eight specific goals of the MDGs, which we can think of as, as a way of defining what we mean by development. And these are then associated with 21 targets. So each goal often comes with one or more targets, which in turn, each target translates into one of 60 indicators which are a way of seeing if the target has been achieved and therefore has the goal been achieved as well. This is the, um, just to give you a sense of this goals, targets, indicator business, because we'll come back to it. Um, this is goal two, two of the MDGs to achieve universal primary education. The target of achieving that, which sounds a lot like the goal, is to ensure that by 2015, children everywhere, boys and girls alike, will be able to complete a full course of primary schooling. And how do we know that that's been achieved? Well, we have three indicators. The first one is the net enrollment ratio in primary education. And that's basically how many kids are enrolled in school who are of the appropriate age for that level of schooling. But enrollment isn't all that we mean by achieving universal primary education, you could not only have your parents enroll you, but you better like continue going to school and finish it. So the second indication is the proportion of pupils starting grade one who reached the last grade of primary. Uh, you know, in some countries that's five years, in some countries it's six, it varies. But it's not enough to go to school, you have to learn something as well. And so the goal is to achieve universal primary education. It's not universal primary schooling. Schooling is an act. Education is an outcome. And so the indicator for goal two and that target is the literacy rate of 15 to 24-year-olds for both men and women. So this is how the MDGs were. Um, this is what they look like. Again, eight goals, 21 targets, and over 60 indicators. Um, the background paper that you've been assigned for the SDGs uh, sees that there's been a proliferation of goals, targets, goals and targets. Um, from the eight MDGs, the report you've been given has 12 
goals. The SDGs have 12, so we've gone from 8 to 12, a 50 percent increase. There's another background report for the SDGs that has 17 goals. It's not clear where between 12 and 17 the final declaration will rest. Um, the number of targets, of course, has expanded. In the report you've been given, it's grown from 21 in the MGGs to 54 in the SDGs. And in the report you're given, they haven't even attempted to list how many indicators there will be, but there'll clearly be more than 60. Okay. Why this pro proliferation of goals, targets, and indicators? Is this really necessary? Okay. That's the first question I want to raise with you. Is it helpful? And to begin to answer this question, I want to consider an alternative to this expansion of goals, targets, and indicators. Why not rely on just one? One goal, one target, one indicator. Why not just rely on that, on GDP per capita? GDP per capita, GDP stands, how many have taken Econ 102? Just about it, well, almost everybody. So for those who haven't or for those who have and have forgotten, GDP stands for Gross Domestic Product. And Gross Domestic Product is a way that all nations in the world for many, many decades now, it's a measure of national income. It's the value of all goods and services produced in an economy in a given year. You divide by the total population and you have a measure of the value of output per person. And the wonderful thing about the way an economic system works is all output is somebody's income. So we can also think of GDP per capita as a measure of the average income for each person in the society. Um, in the first handout you have, what do we know about sort of GDP per capita and the way the world is broken down? So this is from World Bank data. And the World <coughs> Bank, in a somewhat arbitrary way, but has been doing this for a long time, has divided the world into uh, four categories, nations are either low income, lower middle income, upper middle income, or high income. And whether or not a country falls in one of those categories depends upon its um, GNI, which is related to GDP. It's a similar measure uh, per capita. And you can see the World Bank has these standards. A nation is low income if it's uh, per capita income is under $1,045 a year. It reaches high income if it's over $12,745 a year. In the third column, I have the number of countries in the world. Um, this is based on countries that have at least 30,000 people. So there's some very small island economies not included here, but we've got 214 countries. That's the way they're divided. I've told you what the percentage of the world's population is and the numbers of people who live in countries like this, of the over 7 billion people who today inhabit the planet. Um, the one, two, three, four. This column, the fifth column, tells you the poverty rate as defined as the percentage of the population in low income or middle income countries that suffer from extreme or absolute poverty, which means living at less than a dollar. 25 a day. And the final column has to do with life expectancy, um, a measure that we all have some understanding of what it means. So if, if you take a look at, at these numbers, is there, is there anything that you find interesting, surprising you? At the lunch break, you're going to call mom or dad and say, you know, how much you learned at the Albright Institute today. Um, anything, anything here surprise you? Or if you, we switched places and you were standing in front of the room, you'd want to draw attention to? Yeah? So is there a poverty rate of 0% in the high income countries? The poverty rate, so you're surprised that in the high income countries, the poverty rate is zero. And the reason for that is that's an incredibly low poverty rate, right? So $1.25 a day. You know, multiply that by 365, do, uh, 365 days, that would be an income of, you know, about $450 a year. And in high income countries, to a level of statistical significance of one decimal point, nobody lives below that 
that level. It's just such a low poverty line. So if we, of course, have poverty in the United States or in France or Japan, but the poverty line is much, much higher than $1.25. How about, like, homeless people who don't have income like that? Homeless people um, could conceivably fall below that level, but there's such a tiny percentage. So when we have a population of 1.3 billion people, the number of homeless people who, in fact, have less than $500 a year of income available to them would, you know, I don't know which, how many digits we'd have, decimal points we'd have to go out, but nowhere is near the first one. Okay. Anything else? So that's a tentative hand, yeah. Um, how do these numbers correlate to like standards of living in countries? Because I know in some countries, a dollar twenty-five can get you farther and more than in like say the United States. So when this is done, a dollar twenty-five is computed in something called purchasing power parity, which would take the rest of the hour to fully explain, so I'm, I'm going to not try to do that. Um, but in essence, when these poverty rates are converted, it's in the dollar twenty-five. what a dollar twenty-five represents to you and me is what it would represent in Indian rupees or Ethiopian burr or whatever the currency was. So the when you go, oh, but $1.25 goes so much farther in India than it does in the United States, that's taken care of in the way these numbers are represented. Okay. Well, one of the things that I, I hoped you'd take away from this that you maybe you did or didn't know before, it's that most of the nations of the world are high income. Um, we primarily live in a middle income world. Um, 70% of the world's population lives in middle-income countries. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that India today is a lower middle-income country and China is an upper middle-income country, and those are the two population giants of the world. That poverty rates fall dramatically as income rises. <coughs> this is a useful number to remember, that a little bit less than 15% of the world's population still lives in extreme poverty. And I think the other thing to take away from the, the simple chart is that as income rises, life expectancy rises in a monotonic fashion. Okay. So this chart was intended to um, tell you a little bit about the world. You may have known some of these things. Maybe there's something new here. But it's also meant as a setup to think about, can we just pick GDP per capita as the one goal one target, one indicator, as opposed to this massive proliferation of goals, targets, and indicators that are part of the SGDs. Why, why, do, why can't we just rely on GDP per capita? And I want to have you talk about this a little bit amongst yourselves. So we've got two questions. I want to divide the class in half. I'm staring at you. The feng shui of how you distributed yourself is terrible for these purposes. But how about I'm going to divide the class uh, vertically, the first three rows is going to get one question, the second three rows is going to get another question. Uh, talk to the people sitting next to you, two or three people. We're going to take three minutes to do this, okay? So now I'm going to give you your, your assignment, okay? So the bottom half of the class, <coughs> your question is, why might GDP per capita alone be a good goal, target, indicator um, for economic development. Why might, why might that be a good thing? And what I want you to do, you know, just form little groups, talk very quickly, come up with a list and we'll, we'll, we'll put this list on the board. And the second half of the group of the class, the, from the fourth row up, what I want you to talk about amongst yourselves is why might GDP per capita be a bad goal, target, or indicator? Why might you think it was a bad indicator? So top half bad, bottom half have a conversation amongst yourselves. It is five minutes to 11. I'm going to stop you in three minutes. Okay. Okay. You've had enough time. It wasn't a hard question. Okay, so these are the, the rules that I've been instructed that um, you're going to get the microphone and you need to identify yourself 
um, before you answer. So we're going to start with why we might think GDP per capita would be a poor or a bad target, goal target or indicator. That was the top half of the class. So who wants to have us start? Somebody volunteer up there. Just give me one. We'll, we'll get a couple people to, to come in. So just give me your top, top um, reason. Sustainability, it doesn't measure how sustainably you're, you're using the resources. It might, there might be a short-term boom in your economy, but 50 years from now, that might decline. Tell me what you mean by sustainability in this case. I was thinking in terms of natural resources, um, what's fueling your economic growth, if that is natural resources, how you're using them. Okay. Someone else, second reason you don't want to use GDP per capita. Someone over there, Sabrina. Um, Introduce GDP, yourself, please. I'm Sabrina. GDP per capita doesn't take into account inequalities within a country. OK, and why is that a problem? Um, because GDP could be growing, but a few people at the top could be controlling everything, and a lot of people could be poor. Do you think this applies to where you come from? Yes. Okay. <laughs> a little bit about it to the class. Um, I'm from Ethiopia, and our GDP is supposedly growing, but the poverty rates are really high, up to where it says low income, about 50%. And a lot of, a few people control a lot of the resources, and that's a big problem that's not captured in GDP per capita. You said your GDP per capita supposedly is growing. Do you doubt that? Yes. Mm -hmm. You do? I do. Well, <laughs> I, it is growing, but I think the government is inflating the numbers for their own political advancement. Okay. But you don't <coughs> doubt that GDP per capita is growing. Does, I don't does doubt. Does Addis look growth. any different now than it, you remember it as a child? Um, right now it's looking worse because everything is under construction and you can't <laughs> go anywhere. <laughs> so all the roads. Are construction is part of construction. GDP, and yeah. lots of construction is usually an indication that the economy. But yeah, is it's it's okay. booming. Great. <laughs> Does um, there, so we got a sustainability issue, an inequality issue. Um, anybody in the group have anything else, please? Um, it doesn't State take, your name. Oh, sorry, Nina. Um, it doesn't take into account quality of life or happiness, like the overall well-being of the people in the country. I'm going to dodge the happiness issue. OK, is there anything else somebody wants to add to this list? Taylor, get a microphone. Um, basically, you, there's no measurement of agency, the ability to have your own religion, so freedom of expression, it's kind of basic human rights that aren't taken into account. I wasn't sure if that was different from quality of life. But. I'm going to call those non-economic goals. Because um, we don't usually think of freedom of expression specifically as an economic goal. Okay, great. So these are, these are the list I, I expected. You know, I could show you my notes. I don't have Taylor's because I was thinking more about some of the economic problems of, of per capita income. The sustainability issue, it could be about natural resources, which is what the students suggested, but it also could be about the environment. One of the real problems with GDP is it measures goods and services. It doesn't measure bads in an economy. So that if we have a lot of output, but we're also polluting the planet, polluting, excuse me, polluting the, the soil, the water, the air, th we should kind of be taking that, subtracting that out. One could make a similar argument about natural resources. If you pump all the oil out of the ground, what are you going to do 50 years from now? And so GDP per capita doesn't really take account of that. So that's a common criticism. Inequality, of course, as, as uh, Sabrina said, we may have that the per capita income of a country is in Ethiopia today, I don't quite know what the number would be, but uh, in, uh, it is a low-income country, so it's something under $1,000 as measured um, at market exchange rates. But it may be that there are many, many people who subsist on $150 or $200 a year, well below the poverty line, and other people live very well. Um, I spent, I think, more money to spend a night in the Sheridan in Addis than at any other hotel I have ever lived, stayed at in my life, which was sort of weird. Like, I'm in one of the poorest nations in the world, and I'm spending more per night at a hotel. That, that just seemed very odd. Um, so inequality is clearly 
uh, something that GDP per capita, it's an average, and it doesn't tell us anything about how people actually live. Um, quality of life, income, of course, is not the end. It's a means to an end. And so just looking at income, you know, uh, that's not enough. That's not what we mean by development. Well, the top half of the class had the easy question. The bottom half of the class is the hard question. What would be good about using GDP per capita as an indicator of development? Emma. Um, uh, we talked about how since life expectancy increases with GDP, we can also probably guess that health overall increases and people have better access to health care. Okay. Or, or just better health overall. How about if we were talking about education? If I had a, an extra column there for education, how do you think it would look? It would increase as you go down the chart. And so well. therefore, what are we saying about income and these other things we care about? They're correlated. They're correlated. Okay. So one is income and X, life expectancy, health, housing, nutrition, you name it, are correlated. Another? Hey, I'm Hero. Um, we said it could be good for identifying the extremities. Um, so we thought that maybe in upper middle income or high income, it might not be necessarily true that an increase in GDP um, leads to an increase in health or education. But maybe at like the very uh, bottom end, where there is such low income, um, increases in money do lead to these things. Um, okay, so the correlation, this is expanding the correlation argument? Yeah, and I guess. It's saying that um, at low incomes, these things are well correlated. At higher incomes, you know, one of the problems with life expectancy is there is an upper bound, <laughs> um, <laughs> we think. And so therefore, like, you know, if you go from uh, $20,000 to $30,000 per capita income, it may be that there isn't much benefit in terms of life expectancy. Okay. Correlation argument again. Hi, I'm Maria Jose. We talked about how GDP is a straightforward and clear measure that is easy to define and easy to measure across all countries. Simplicity. Anything else? I'm Betsy, um, and for uh, so it's it's good for a basis of comparison because um, whereas countries may have different values or priorities, um, increasing GDP allows that a country increases their access to different opportunities, and they can choose those opportunities for themselves and which priorities they have instead of trying to choose one that all countries are looking for. Okay, I'm going to interpret that a little bit with the same meaning, is that income is a measure of capacity. And then societies, different societies, are going to choose how to use that capacity. You have to spend much more on housing in Nepal than you need to in a tropical climate, because the weather is very different. And society should have those choices. It's pretty clear that in order to achieve economic development, it's necessary for your income to rise. You have to have greater capacity to do things. Because if income doesn't rise, then all you can do is redistribute what you have. That might work in a rich country like the United States. Economic growth in this country maybe is not that necessary. The highest earning person last year in the United States was a man by the name of David Tepper. Anyone who hasn't taken a class with me know what David Tepper's job is. Let me ask another question. We'll come back to that. It's the highest earning person in the United States, according to the Forbes list of the highest paid individuals. How much do you think you made last year? Highest paid person. What do you think? Let's start. Kim Bottomley makes about $600,000 a year. That's public record. So she's not the highest paid person, so it's more than that. <laughs> Allison, what do you think? Highest paid person in the United States last year? A number. 
12 million. Yeah. 300 million. 2.2 billion. That's how much David Tepper made last year. And what is his job, Joe? Guess? Hedge fund manager. Hedge fund manager. <laughs> I knew you knew the answer. I would never call in a colleague if, if I thought he or she didn't. <laughs> so it's possible in the United States we could get a lot of economic development by simply redistributing income. David Tepper's 2.2 billion. The highest paid CEO in the United States last year earned a, his name is John Hammergren, works in a medical supply, very large medical supply. And he made 130 million, top paid CEO in the United States. I almost feel bad for him. You know, David Tepper paid 2.2 billion. <laughs> Highest paid CEO, only 130 million. Okay, we could redistribute that, those people's incomes and maybe that could produce economic development. But in Ethiopia, and there's some very rich people in Ethiopia, but if we redistributed their incomes, we still couldn't make a dent. What we really need is economic growth. And that economic growth creates the capacity, as Betsy was saying, to do what societies choose to do. So there's clearly some things that would be bad about using GDP per capita, some things that would be good. I want to focus a little bit on this issue, is how well is income correlated with other things. <coughs> and for that, I want to show you this picture, which I believe you have in front of you. How many of you came to um, the Goldman Lecture this year when Angus Deaton spoke from Princeton? A few of you? Okay, so if you were there, Angus Deaton showed this graph too. And what this graph is, is on the vertical axis is life expectancy measured in years. Um, it's for 2009, but it would look the same if, if I had updated it for more recent data. On the horizontal axis is GDP per capita. And each of the circles represents an individual country. Some of them are labeled. And the size of the circle is proportional to the population of that country. So the big circles are India and China, um, the two most populous nations in the world. The USA is another big circle over there. And if we look at <coughs> what some of you said was a good thing about GDP per capita, that income <coughs> and this other thing, X, life expectancy in this instance, are well correlated. Well, you know, that's true. It's not a linear relationship, but it's pretty clear that life expectancy rises first very rapidly as income rises, and then it levels off, and it levels off because uh, there's, at this point in time, at least a ceiling to how long people can live. So if we're thinking about this, about you know, is GDP per capita really good, or do we have to go the SDG and MDG routes to specify things about child mortality and life expectancy and all sorts of very specific health indicators, or is income a reasonably good enough proxy? Uh, for those of you who have taken some statistics, how many of you have taken any statistics at this point? QR requirement, almost everybody, great. Little regression there. And the R-squared of this very simple regression between life expectancy and GDP per capita is 63%. It means this one variable income explains 63% of the variation in life expectancy. That's a very, very um, large percentage, but it's not 100%. So these things are positively correlated. Income is clearly correlated with life expectancy. It's not perfectly correlated. One of the things that's a little hard to figure out is what's really going on at these very low incomes. Everything's kind of crowded together. If there was a logarithmic scale here, it would be a little bit easier to see. And I want to kind of unbundle what's going on here. It looks like as income rises, life expectancy goes up. We can look at this whole graph and see there are exceptions. Russia is way below the line. Life expectancy is much lower in Russia than it would be predicted based on income alone. It's much lower in South Africa. Why? AIDS, AIDS crisis. Okay. Higher in Portugal, higher in South Korea. They're above the line. Equatorial Guinea happens to have a very high GDP per capita because it's a very tiny nation with very, very few people sitting on a giant lake of oil. And um, all the oil wealth is controlled by about five people. Okay. So it's a very backwards economy with a very high per capita income. But I want to kind of take a look a little bit more at what's going on here. 
in order to make the point that income isn't really the full story of what determines life expectancy. And here I've picked three groups of countries, all of which each group has roughly the same income. So the first group, El Salvador, Armenia, and Angola, they all have sort of around a little bit over $7,000 per capita income um, measured in this PPP thing I'm, I noted before. And look, life expectancy is pretty different. 51 in Angola versus 74 in Armenia or 72 in El Salvador. Clearly something other than income determines life expectancy in those three countries. In the middle group, Nigeria, India, and Vietnam, again, they're also between 5,000 and 5,400. And again, huge difference in life expectancy in those three countries. And the same thing is true for the bottom group, Bangladesh and Cameroon and Kenya, much poorer countries, um, of between 2,500 and $3,000 per capita income. And again, huge variance in life expectancy. So what I think we have to take away from this exercise is that while increases in GDP per capita are correlated with the things we care about, the, the things that we think of as development, that they're not perfectly correlated. And it's for that reason, this chart, why as attractive from the point certainly of simplicity, GDP per capita is not enough it's how income is used is as important as how much income there is. So it was a good attempt, but we got to go in a different direction. Okay. So what direction might we go in? Let me pause there and catch my breath. Any questions about anything, any of the charts, anything I've said, anything you want me to say again? You want to watch my grandson again? Yeah. <laughs> Anything? Priyanka? Hi, my name is Priyanka, and you probably will go into this um, later in the presentation, but if you look at a lot of the, the lower outliers, they seem to be in Africa, um, West and Central Africa. I'm looking at Nigeria and Cameroon. And so do you think that we can... I mean, how can you explain like the fact that these lower numbers seem to be concentrated in in certain parts of the world? Do you th can we explain it through like defective institutions, or are there are there other sort of? That's a answers? big question. Um, it wasn't something I was planning on addressing because what I really want to talk about is how to think about things like the SDGs and the MDGs. Um, I think. Why is Africa on the low end <coughs> of these things? I think part of it is the disease environment that was, is, yeah. is, is a huge issue. So that um, whether it's HIV AIDS, whether it's Ebola, whether it's malaria, um, there's something about the incidence of disease. The other thing that's true about um, Angola, Nigeria, and Cameroon, which are the low ones here, is that those are resource-dependent economies. Resource-dependence, uh, Angola and Nigeria are oil, and Cameroon, I'm not sure if they have oil, how much th they're dependent on oil or what resources they're dependent upon. But resource-rich countries have huge, unique problems about inequality and how the government spends resources. There are no other resource countries, not Bangladesh is only people, uh, India is not a resource rich country, Vietnam isn't, El Salvador isn't Armenia. So I think that it's the combination of the disease environment and the combination of the dependence on resources is part of it. Yeah. I'm curious, um, the countries like Portugal and Japan that seem to be particularly far above the line, are there reasons why they do so well? Well, the Japanese diet has long been claimed to be healthier than the Western diet. It's also a very homogeneous society, which perhaps has some advantages. Um, <coughs> I don't know the answer, and in some sense, I'm going to duck it. That's a rich nation question about why does some, you know, is it the Mediterranean diet? Is it this? Is it that? Um, I don't think we have a full handle 
on the on the answer to that, and 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 I don't have a brilliant insight for it off the top of my head. Okay. So we got to do something. We can't rely on GDP per capita. So I first encountered the debate over how to define development in graduate school. And one of the first papers that I remember reading on the subject was by a British economist by the name of Dudley Sears. And it was a paper published in 1972 in the Journal of Development Studies. And it was entitled, What Are We Trying to Measure? which is also the title of my talk today. This is a paragraph from the paper. It's is pretty clear. So think about the progression that we're doing. <coughs> We've decided that GDP per capita isn't such a good idea. There are too many problems with it. We've got to find some other way of defining development. And this is what Sears has to say, and the highlighting is, is mine. The question to ask about a country's development is therefore what has been happening to poverty, what has been happening to unemployment, what has been happening to inequality. If all three of these have become less severe, then beyond doubt, this has been a period of development for the country concerned. If one or two of these central problems have been getting worse, especially if all three have, it would be strange to call the result development, even if per capita income had soared. So Equatorial Guinea would be a case where Dudley Sears would say per capita income has soared, economic development hasn't taken place. So Dudley Sears is very, very clear about what he thinks development is. It's less poverty, less unemployment, and less inequality. But that's not the only view. So I want to jump ahead about 18 years after Dudley Sears wrote this paper um, to the work of the United Nations, specifically the UNDP. which stands for the United Nations Development Program, which is the arm of the UN that's concerned with development issues. And the UNDP in 1990 will publish its first human development report. Um, <coughs> this is a flagship publication of the UN. It's been published every year since 1990. And in that first year, the UNDP introduces the HDR, <coughs> excuse me, the HDI, the Human Development Index. It's most often associated with the work of two South Asian economists, the late Mahbub al-Haq, a Pakistani economist, and Amatya Sen, an Indian economist, who's an economist, a philosopher, a Nobel laureate, um, one, a, a really remarkable individual. And like Dudley Sears, they cite three things that they think is the, is the definition of economic development, but they're quite different than what Dudley Sears cited. So what the Human Development Index is, is according to Mahbub al-Haq and um, Amatya Sen and many other people who worked on this at the time in 1990, is that what they thought development meant was enlarging people's choices. Okay. Three critical words, enlarging people's choices. And in order to be able to do so, you should be able to lead a long and healthy life. That's why health is there. You should have the ability to acquire knowledge. That's why education is there. And you should have access to resources needed for a, different, for a decent standard of living. And that's why living standards are there. So Sears was poverty, unemployment, and inequality. The Human Development Index is health, education, and living standards. These are different. They are not the same thing. And in order to compute this index, we need indicators of each of these things. And this bottom row are the indicators that were, choosen, that were chosen. Life expectancy at birth, mean years of schooling, expected years of schooling, and gross national income per product hour, a version of our old friend GDP per capita. So the Human Development Index takes these different indicators, has a complex weighting scheme that involves taking the cubic root of something, um, which doesn't have been often in the social sciences. And it comes up with one number. And the UNDP thought that the HDI, the Human Development Index, would really replace GDP per capita as a goal for development, that nations should strive to increase 
their HDI, and if they were, then we would know the development was actually taking place. The details of how this index are constructed is, is complex, and for those of you who are taking registered for Econ 220 next semester, and are any of you? I don't know. A few of you are. We'll spend a fair bit of time looking at how this index is constructed. For now, I'm going to skip over that. But what comes out of this process is a, is a number, a single number. So in 2013, the most recent year that we have for the Human Development Index, 187 nations had the data available to, to, to make this computation. <coughs> and Nor Norway was the number one country. It had an HDI of 0.944. That's the number, 0.944. Uh, the African, Sub-Saharan African nation of Niger had the lowest HDI in the world of 0.337. And the country right in the middle, the median, had an HDI of 0.717, and that nation was Dominica. What do you know about Dominica? You were all of a generation that there's something you should know about Dominica. Where is it, first of all? I'll write it down on the board as you're thinking. It is not called Dominica. Uh, it's Domi it's called Dominica. I've been there, so I know that's how the <laughs> locals call it. It's not Dominica, it's Dominica. Where is it? Anyone know? I heard noise, but somebody raised a hand. I just couldn't find the sound. The Caribbean? Caribbean. And what's famous? What do you know about Dominica? Everybody in this room knows something about Dominica. I know it. I do not know it. No. <laughs> it had a. Very troublesome dictatorship. Oh. No, that's not what everybody like, knows. Trujillo. <laughs> it's where the second Pirates of the Caribbean was. <laughs> <laughs> the United States is number five on the HDI rankings. The HDI includes GDP per capita or some measure, GNP per capita, <coughs> our old friend, but it, it includes some more things. And the UN really wanted to push this in the <coughs> 1990s as an alternative um, to GDP per capita as, as, as the goal. But the index has a lot of problems. Uh, the way it's calculated has changed a fair bit over the last 20 plus years. There was a major haul in 2010. And one of its many problems is that it, it doesn't have any inherent meaning. So knowing that Dominica has a HDI of 0.717, what does that mean? When I tell you a nation or the world has life expectancy of 70, you have some idea what that means. But what this thing, it's an index. It has a value. The value can go up over time, but it doesn't have any inherent intrinsic meaning, which I think is a liability of it. The HDI seems to have faded away, but where I've taken you from is GDP per capita, Dudley Sears, UNDP, the different ways of thinking about and defining development. And this was a, a big push in the 1990s. All of you would have, heur have heard of the HDI had the Albright Institute existed in the 1990s and I was making this presentation. Now I suspect some of you have heard about it, maybe were introduced in some class or other, but it's really not something has much cachet. It was pushed aside by the MDGs. So now we're up to the MDGs. The MDGs moved away from the idea of some single, simple, relatively simple measure of development to coming up with a much broader definition. These are the eight goals of the MDGs, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality and empower women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, diseases ensure environmental sustainability, and develop a partnership, a global partnership for development. <coughs> what is interesting about the MDGs is not only now do we have a proliferation of goals, targets, and indicators, but GDP per capita disappears. Growth in GDP per capita is not a goal. Economic growth is not an MDG goal. It is not a target. It isn't even an indicator. 
it disappears, and yet everything we sort of were talking about before sort of still had economic growth as central to the development process. It disappears, and now we're only talking about a very, very broad list of outcomes. <coughs> The MDGs with their eight goals, 21 targets, and 60 indicators provide a very broad mapping of what development entails, but there's no discussion of the trade-offs between them, you know, which one's most important, what should take priority. There's very little discussion of how these are to be achieved and how they are to be financed. They're a set of goals with a timetable. Do this by 2015, the year where we are today. So what I want to do now is to assess how, world, how well the world has done in achieving these goals over the last 15 years. Um, and I hope this assessment will inform your thinking about what comes next, the SDGs, which will be part of what you're thinking about over the next three weeks. So each year, the UN published something that's called the Millennium Development Goals Report. This is the most recent one for 2014. And I'm going to turn quickly to page 10. Let's talk about goal one, extreme, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. The target is to have, or target 1A at the top of the chart, is to have between 1990 and 2015 the proportion of people whose income is less than a dollar a day. And I want you to go all the way down to the bottom of the chart, and let's just look at these two bars for a moment. In 1990, 36% of the world fell below the $1.25 extreme poverty line. And by 2010, five years short of the target, and the reason this report only goes up to 2010 is it takes a very long time to get estimates of poverty. They're lagged three or four years. So this is the most recent data that we have available or that the UN had available as they were publishing this report. And the green line is the 2015 target. And that's wonderful news. At a global level, the MDG target has been achieved. In 15 years, or actually from 1990, which was the start to 2015, that's 25 years. That global target that was set in 2000 has been achieved. The reason it's been achieved at a global level is because of China. China had a poverty rate in 1990 of 60%. It's down to 12%. And there are an awful lot of Chinese people. And so from the world perspective, the gains have been tremendous. If we look at a regional perspective, we go up to Sub-Saharan Africa, the news is not so good. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the movement has only been from 56 to 48 percent. So that if we think of the MDGs as a global target, great success over the last 15 years, as was shown in the, the brown shaded bars a moment ago. But if we begin to look at regions, Sub-Saharan Africa has not done very well. South Asia has done well. It hasn't quite met the target and probably will um, by 2015. And uh, in Latin America and other parts, the target was always an easy one to reach because those countries were already quite affluent um, and $1.25 a day was just way too low a poverty line. So we can take away from the first MDG that if we look at it at an aggregate level, it's been achieved. If we look at it at a regional level, the story is more mixed. And if we focus specifically on sub-Saharan Africa, the bar was, was really too high. Um, <coughs> many people think that the growth rates, Africa would have had to experience growth rates like China did. There were reasons to think Africa didn't have that ca capability. And therefore, from the beginning, there was a sense that Africa could not meet the targets in 15 years, that that was known at the time the MDGs um, were uh, created. Let's take a look at another. Do you any, wait, for, let me stop. Any questions about this, about the extreme poverty one? Yeah. If there's such extreme, if there's such extreme regional variation, why was it not initially 
proposed to have regional goals as opposed to global goals? Um, I don't know the answer to that. You're asking a question about how the MDGs were formulated. They were initially formulated as global goals because the sense was what matters is people, not citizenship. I think that was the reason. What's interesting, though, is that they quickly morphed into being both global goals and regional goals, which set some regions up for failure. Um, but I think that the basic motivation was the sense that citizenship doesn't matter. Um, the MDGs were about um, human development, and therefore your citizenship shouldn't matter. And I think that was the argument, but I'd have to go back and check that. Is there another question? Um, I was wondering how the MDGs think about people who live on a dollar thirty a day. So, is it? It's a bit. I mean, I'm sure it's not completely arbitrary, but oh, it's um, if you cross. If the estimates are that an individual, a family, a community has crossed a dollar twenty-five, you are no longer considered poor. And uh, there's a very interesting discussion about this. Um, an economist. I hope you all learn about and read about by the name of Lant Pritchett, has talked about this a great deal in the last couple of years. And Lant Pritchett um, refers to it as kinky development. Okay? That, why is it that if you get past $1.25, like the $1.26, that's great. But if you're at $1.24, it's bad. That there's a kink in the distribution. And Lant has this wonderful phrase. He says, nobody's ever thrown a $1.26 a day party. Okay, that, wow, I got to $1.26. So one criticism of this approach is it's binary. Below $1.25, terrible. Above, you're no longer poor. And of course, that makes no sense. There's a continuum. And there's a healthy debate about how poverty lines should be defi defined as a result of that. I'm Maria, and I was just wondering, so along with that question as a follow-up, has there ever been a specific discussion about like a range to set in those situations? Um, the discussion that's come up is that different regions have to talk about different poverty lines. $1.25 is meaningless for Latin America and the Caribbean. These are all middle-income nations, many of them upper-middle-income nations. But there's still tremendous poverty in these countries. And so therefore, there's a discussion that Latin America should use a different poverty line. A lot of the discussion about poverty lines these days is that nations should pick the poverty lines themselves. Gets back to Betsy's point. Nations should make determinations, their own determinations of what it's to be poor. And so there's some discussion about using national poverty lines as opposed to one global standard. Okay. Yeah. I sort of had a thought while Mario was speaking. Is there, you know, do the other goals in some way account for, you know, better quality of living account for not people not just living above the poverty line as it's arbitrarily defined, but people living with good quality of life. Are the are the is the purpose of the other goals to account for the other factors involved in the poverty line? Probably not for below a dollar twenty five. You don't tend to be really healthy and well educated below a dollar twenty five. I think when one gets to higher levels of income in that sort of lower middle income range, one can talk about um, it's not just income, but it's these other things like Amatya Sen <coughs> and Mabu Bel Haq we're talking about. Um, so that it is possible for societies to improve the health of, of their citizens at, while per capita income is not rising because it has to do with how that money is expended. A dollar twenty-five extreme poverty of this sort, the, the phrase grinding poverty is the appropriate av adjective. Nobody, nothing is compensating for that. Let me move on to quick one. Uh, I don't know if it's quick, but how was a dollar twenty-five established rather than like one thirty or two dollars? Um, I'm going to give a real. That's a really good question. I'll give a really short answer because it's really long and complicated and interesting. Basically, what was done was <coughs> in a reference year, the World Bank took a group of the poorest nations in the world, looked at their national poverty lines, converted them using purchasing power parity to dollars, and took the average. And the average came to about $1.25 a day. 
it's a much longer story because the poverty line used to be a dollar a day, and then it got changed. But I don't have time, and you have to take Econ 220 to, to hear that whole story. <laughs> I'm going to skip one of the MDGs, and I'm going to go and jump to page 28. I'm going to take a look at improve maternal health, reduced by three quarters between 1990 and 2015, the maternal mortality rate. Let's cycle down to the world, and we can see there has been progress, but no way is it going to be met. This is an MDG that's done very poorly. The green line represents the target. Maternal mortality was 380 per thousand in the world as a whole in 1990. Here we have data up to 23. It's fallen to 210, but that falling by three quarters is, is nowhere near in sight, and it isn't going to happen. One of the troubling things about the MDGs is that there's this binary sense of we've achieved them or we haven't achieved them. But take a look at what's happened in sub-Saharan Africa. Internal mortality has fallen from about 990 um, per 100,000 live births. I'm sorry, I said 1,000 before I meant 100,000. 990 um, deaths for women in childbirth per 100,000 live births, and it's fallen in half from a th about 1,000 to about 500 in the span of a relatively short period of time, 25 years. That's incredible achievement. But Sub-Saharan Africa has failed. It hasn't achieved the MDGs. So there's this real problem with the MDGs that perceptions of success or, or success can be perceived as failure because there's this very rigid target. It's not a greater achievement in absolute terms than any other region has been realized. But yet, the way we set up these goals, the notion of goals. So I, I was trying to think of an analogy. So if you enter next semester and you say, I'm going to go straight A. I'm going to take four courses and I'm going to get A's in all of them. Well, you're most likely not going to. Um, it's not a bad goal. It's a good goal to have. And if you, know, you do really well and you're satisfied, but you didn't reach that target, you should feel good about your achievements, not bad about them. And, and there's a little bit of that flavor to what's going on here. I want to show you another way of um, looking at the MDGs. I worked for a year. I took a sabbatical at the World Bank a number of years ago in 1994, 95. And I, I worked with uh, an editor who said, when you look at a chart, you should be able to tell, figure out what it's telling you in three seconds. That's the sign of a good chart. This one fails <laughs> that test miserably. But it's a really interesting chart. So I have to give you some help understanding this chart. Okay. So previously, we were looking at success and failure at meeting the MDGs at a global level and at a regional level. These data are going to tell us about success and failure at a country level. Okay. So nine different MDG targets are on the horizontal axis. Extreme poverty, maternal mortality, uh, undernourishment, primary completion. You can see these. Um, they're very similar to the eight MDG goals I cited before. Now, I'm going to change something in this graph. So this is really important to remember because for some reason it's going to disappear in the way the, the, the graph works. You see the, um, the key to reading the chart, that if you're in the green bar, that may, means the target met. So the target was met. So this refers to countries. So for example, 25% of, um, sorry, let me do this one, 46% of all the countries in the developing world, it's low and middle income countries, 46% of them met the target. This sort of other greenish color, what, we would, what, what color would you call that? Mustard. I'm sorry? <laughs> I, 
I, I like that word. What was the word? Oh, I said puce. Puce. I like it. Okay, puce. The puce color. That's sufficient progress. So the greenish hues are good news. And then we start going into insufficient progress, moderately off target, seriously off targets, the red. And the gray is insufficient data. And if they're insufficient data, that usually means not good things. You know, so it's poor places usually don't have the data. So I'm going to change this a little bit um, so that we can read this a little bit easier time. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Why the, you know, the, the progress status disappears when one does this, I don't know. But what's interesting about looking at this table is now we're looking at the percentage of countries that have achieved the MDGs. It's very, very different than thinking about global. Because when we look at countries, now very small countries, in terms of population, count the same as big countries. So the Gambia country in West Africa, which has fewer than 2 million people, when we're going to compute these percentages, it's going to have the same weight as China or India or Ethiopia, which are countries with a large population. And you can make arguments why you might want to look at it at a global perspective, where <coughs> a person is a person, their citizenship doesn't matter, or why you might want to look at things at a country level. This is at a country level. So if we take a look at meeting, having um, the rate of absolute poverty, we see that about half of the nations of the world, of the developing world, have achieved that. That's our puce and chartreuse. Is this? Maybe chartreuse. I remember being told that if you had a car the color in between these two, it was more likely to be spotted than any other car color you could drive. Okay, so therefore safe color. So, when we look at the first MDG, about half the nations of the world achieved it, and then if I'm going to include the 22% without in any information, which are places like South Sudan, Somalia, Afghanistan, fragile states, states uh, at war of some sort or another where data collection is very difficult to do, um, it's a little bit better than half the nations of the world have achieved the MDGs. Uh, the first MTG. But then as we, we start going down the rows, we're beginning to see um, you know, success at education gender parity. That looks pretty good. Improved water looks pretty good. The others look pretty dismal, from, viewed from a country perspective. Okay. So this was sort of a snapshot of how well has the world done in achieving the MDGs, this is for a uh, report for 2013. <coughs> Excuse me. We're not quite at 2015. For some of these indicators, the results might only be for 2010. But I think we can be fairly confident that the majority of MDGs will not be realized by 2015. That the majority of MDGs and the majority of nations in the world are not going to achieve these goals set in the year 2000. That's at least what I take away from this chart. Any question about what this chart shows? Yeah. Does that mean that probably like, that's the they will maybe the sort it. of the sufficient progress of so the likelihood is they're 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 pretty close to being on target. Maybe they'll make it. Maybe they'll be a little bit off but they're viewed as generally achieving the results. Okay. So I've got 10 minutes, and what I'd like to do in wrapping up is to think about development goals, because you guys are going to be thinking about the SDGs, okay, about the next version of this. We started talking about GDP per capita as an index of development. What do we mean by development? Is GDP per capita a good way to go? The answer is kind of no. Dudley Sears, Human Development Index was another approach, then the MDGs. Now a little background on what we know about the MDGs and how well they've done. Um, if we had more time, I would again break the class into two groups, and I'd ask two questions. 
what is it about the MDGs that we think are a good thing as a measure of development? And is there anything that we might conclude is a bad thing about using the MDGs as a way of defining development? Um, <coughs> we don't have time to do that, so I'm just going to talk for a few more minutes. What's very important to realize is the question I would have posed to you is not, is it a good thing to cut extreme poverty in half in, 15, in 25 years? Or is it a good thing or not for maternal mortality to fail, to fall dramatically? Or is it a good thing or not for every kid to go to school, both boys and girls? The answer to that is obvious. Of course it is. All of those things are desirable. There's no question about that. The question is, is it a good thing to set these goals? Is that worthwhile? Has that contributed to positive outcomes? Is there any harm that these things might have done? It's in the setting of the goals, maybe in the selection of the goals too. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Not are the goals themselves good or bad, because that's obvious. But is it in the process of setting the goals in these highly publicized international meetings? Is this a good idea or not? The question is, what is accomplished when the UN or some other international body comes up with a declaration that these are the goals we hope to achieve in the next 15 years? It is so important to realize that the UN declaration is not a treaty. It did not oblige anyone to do anything. Treaties require nations to do things. This was a declaration. The declaration made suggestions for rich nations to increase the amount of foreign aid um, that they would commit for development. But there are no numerical targets for increasing foreign aid in the MDGs and certainly no commitment to do so. The MDGs made suggestions for targets for domestic policy, get more girls in school, reduce the incidence of HIV AIDS. But developing <coughs> nations were not required to change their priorities or their policies. The UN Millennium Declaration was simply an aspirational document. This is what we hope to achieve in 15 years. Now, there are competing views on what the MDGs might accomplish. Supporters of the MDGs and Jeffrey Sachs, who heads the Earth Institute at Columbia University, was one of the major public intellectuals supporting the MDGs. And Sachs would argue that the MGDs would focus <coughs> global attention on well-defined and solvable problems. And it would motivate no nations to do what needed to be done, and it would help to mobilize the resources to do so. So by this aspirational document would define what do we need to do, and once we've told people what we need to do, that would motivate them to do what was necessary. But there are different views as well. Um, I ask that you take a look at a piece by Michael Clemens and Todd Moss. These are not name brand economists like Jeffrey Sachs or Amartya Sen. Um, and in that piece by Clemens and Moss, they're both economists at the Center for Global Development, a DC-based think tank that works on development issues. And they wrote back in the early 2000s that what troubled them about the MDGs is they set unattainable goals for many poor countries, especially those in Africa. That African countries would have to grow at historically unprecedented rates for the region and that, that therefore they were set up to fail in the way in which these goals um, were, um, the way in which the goals were stated initially, and that it therefore might have <coughs> created a perception of, of failure, spread disillusionment among do development constituencies, both donors and, and nations themselves, and instead of encouraging more aid, and engagement, the MDGs would do the opposite. So there were these very, very different perspectives on if the setting of these MDGs was a good idea or not. The evaluation of the consequences of the MDGs started very early on at the time they were set. They've continued ever since, and we'll have more and more evaluations of their impact. 
in the years ahead as we pass 2015 and we have the full set of data that will be required. But any of the evaluation of the MDGs is going to be really, really hard. And the simple reason is, what's the counterfactual? What would the world have been like without them? <laughs> we don't know. Would there be, have been some other goals that would have been set? We can't run the experiment and say, what would have the world been like without them? So it's always going to be very, very difficult to figure things out. <coughs> This research is still in its early phases, and the way it's proceeding is it says, let's take a look at a longer time period, usually around 1990 to 2015. Remember, these goals are set in the year 2000. So let's look at 25 years. Well, if the MDGs made a difference, the setting of these goals by the United Nations, remember, no one was committed to do anything, no numerical targets on foreign aid, no requirements for domestic policy reforms, just an aspirational document. Well, if they made a difference, then we look at the trend, primary school enrollment, maternal mortality, something on water quality, whichever measure indicator you want to look at, we should see that the trend changed sometime after the year 2000 that these things were moving in some direction between 1990 and 2000 before the MDGs were formulated. And if the MDGs made a difference, then after 2000, the slope of the line should change, hopefully in the direction of improvement. Right? And this is where the research is, is started right now. And some of these studies find that foreign aid did increase between the two periods a decade of the 90s versus the last 15 years. So if one of the goals of the MDGs, as Jeff Sachs would argue, is to mobilize donors to give more money to the development project, well, that would be consistent with the trend line shifting after the MDGs were announced and donors being more generous. And there's evidence of that. But of course, the MDGs weren't the only thing that happened in the last 15 years. Lots of things happen. So it's very, very difficult to prove that the MDGs were consistent with more aid and more generosity of the rich nations. We also find that the trend really changes seemingly in a significant way of expenditures on health and development. It's a real difference in the last 15 years than in the previous 10. Once again, was that because of the MDGs? Was it because of something else? We don't really know. But so there's a little good news. We can't reject that the MGGs weren't helpful. There's a little good news on more money going to health, more foreign aid overall. <coughs> Outside of aid, aid flows, um, did the MGGs play a significant role in reducing extreme poverty or maternal mortality or any of the other targets? Here, there's not much evidence of that. If anything, the impact was very small, and in many studies, there's no impact at all. The big reason for the decline in global poverty over the last 25 years was China's economic miracle. That had nothing to do with the setting of the MDGs. Okay, so the massive, the reaching of the global target of cutting poverty in half is because of the Chinese economic miracle and the success of the Chinese people. That's not an MDG story, that's another story. Um, I'm going to quote was my final comment, and I, Joe, 12 o'clock on the button for the first time I gave a talk, that's damn good, <laughs> from Charles Kenny and Andy Summer in a paper, More Money or More Development, What Have the MDGs Achieved? Charles Kenny is a particularly interesting blogger about the MDGs and the SDGs, and I recommend you search his name and read some of his material. And what these two Economists said in the end, finally, the results of the original MDG process should instill a sense of humility. The MDGs have been a powerful force in framing debate and providing donors with a framework for action. But broad-based development is a complex, long-term endeavor. However high level the conference that agrees it, there is only so much a declaration can do. Thank you.